Okay, let's get started. All right. So this chapter is um, very interesting. It's about the Trinity and it's about the, the well, the Nicene or sometimes called the Apostles' Creed. And um, I was actually glad that I got this chapter because we say the um, Nicene Creed in Mass every time we have church. And depending if there's a baptism or during a rosary, um, I've said this my whole life, but um, there's been a few changes in it. And, and I wanted to go over the history first. And then at the end, I do a little comparison. Um, and the book has a creed in there. I'm not sure whose creed they have, but they only have part of it. So what I did is I took a creed that was on the Internet, um, which is like the Nicene Creed. If you Google it, you're going to get about 10 different, I mean, a lot of different versions of it, but it's very close. Um, the Nicene Creed was first around 320, and then they modified it around 380. And then, and we pretty much, the Catholics said that um, with few modifications until uh, 2011. And then you can see the changes because I bolded them. Um, so we'll do the, we'll, we'll talk about the, the creed at the very end, but I'm going to give you the history to begin with. So we'll start with the history. Um, so, so Christianity started, um, of course, um, and it had been going on for about 300 years. And so around 320 in Egypt and Syria and Asia Minor, there was a lot of discussion. And I went back and I read a little bit about this, about the Nicene Creed and, um, uh, and why it was started. And it really, the bishops were all fighting and they were expelling bishops. They were sending people, they were, they were, I don't know what you call it, but there was so much infighting and there was so much disagreement about everything from whether Jesus was um, divine, whether the, whether Christ had come to save us. If, even if, if original sin was the reason that that Christ came to save us. And um, so I'm going to kind of go through those main points because those are the big issues um, with the creed. And um, so anyway, so so the, so the, some of the discussion was whether the father alone was the true God, whether the son was was neither eternal or uncreated. And there's some people that maybe need to be muted. I don't know. I'm, I'm hearing some back noise. Um, Alexander was the Bishop of Alexandria and um, he couldn't ignore how Jesus Christ had come. Could have been God in the same way as God, the father. So that was, that was a real challenge for most people. Arius um, was a presbyter of Alexandria, and he didn't deny Jesus, but he couldn't believe that he was divine. He said Jesus was a strong God and he was a full God, but it was blasphemous, blasphemous to think of Jesus as divine. So um, Arius and Athanasius had different totally different views on on the divinity of Jesus. And the first thing that happened was it's the word is used uh, and I'm some of these words I'm not going to get correct because I don't know if they're Latin or Greek but but I I know ex nibilio nibilo um, they believe that God created the world out of nothing. It means nothing um, based on the scriptures, even though the priestly author of Genesis indicated it was created out of premortal chaos. Um, and uh, later on, we'll talk about that because the, the Greek Orthodox still, from my understanding, um, well, we'll just, we'll talk about that later. Um, the people thought that God, the God of Plato, n was no longer wedded to the God of the Bible based on scripture. This new view during the fourth century contradicted Plato and indicated cosmos was frail and dependent on God. And Christians knew that Jesus had saved them by his death and resurrection. 
Athanasius believe um, that either Christ, the word, belonged to the divine realm of God alone or the fragile created order. Humanity was inherently fragile. God created all things by his eternal logos or son. This logos was made flesh to give us life. And Christ had descended into the mortal world of death and corruption to give us immortality. That was Anna. Athanasius belief around 320 when all of this was going on. Arius, on the other hand, believed that Christ belonged to the fragile created order. He used Proverbs to state that God created wisdom at the very beginning. And eventually Arius um, was a byword for heresy. Um, and you'll see more of this later on. Arius believed that God had superiority over Jesus because he called him father. So he didn't necessarily think that Christ was divine. And he used, he used some of the scriptures to quote that through him, all things came to be not one thing had its being, but through him. Also, St. John made it clear that Jesus was Logos and said that Logos was God himself. St. Paul said that because of Jesus, obedience unto death, God had raised him up and given him the divine title of Lord or Kyrios. And Kyrios, I don't know if it's, I, I think it's Latin. If it's not Latin, it's close to Latin. It's not Latin. Okay. I think it's Greek. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, it's very close to Latin because we use uh, Kyrios Eleison in Latin, meaning um, Lord have mercy and Christ have mercy. So um, anyway, um, so you can see Arius is a, a little different than uh, Anastasia, St. John, St. Paul, and the other believers. And that's why he later becomes a little bit more of the word they use for him is heresy because he doesn't believe that Christ is divine. So finally, after Aaron, all, yes. Well, I think Arius said, didn't disagree that Christ is divine. He said he was not of the same. He wasn't existing with God in the very beginning that he was derived from God, I don't think he denied his divinity. He argued okay. against his uh, status in the How he was created, how he was created if he was dual person. Right. He was a created being who became part of the Godhead in, in our belief. That's the way I understand it. Okay. Okay. Um, so... Um, Um, and this is really confusing. So um, anyway, um, Emperor Constantine intervened um, a synod in Turkey. It's called, it was in the city of Nicaea. And though most had disagreed with Athanasius, he managed to impose his theology on all except Arius and the two other delegates. This made ex niblo, meaning nothing, the world was created out of nothing, an official Christian doctrine, making Christ and the Redeemer as one. So, so basically, I'm sorry. As we say, ex niblo sort of sounds like the Big Bang. Yeah. Well, and I think that that was, there were, okay, so Genesis, in Genesis, it said that God created things out of chaos, but, but during this time when all of this discussion was going on, they, there also was a belief that, that it was created out of nothing, ex nihilo, um, and so I it's guess. Ex nihilo, it's an Thank H. you. Okay. And oh, did I Latin. spell it wrong? It well, it's a typo. 
Okay. Well, I will tell you, the book has some typos in it, too. And I didn't know which one to go by because they spell a couple of things differently for the same word. So possible. Um, Yeah. Okay. So Nihilo. Um, So anyway, they came to an agreement and it was called the Nicene Creed on May 20th. And they all had agreed um, on that, that Christ was divine, that, um, that he created the world and, um, the Aryan crisis, but they still continued to argue over things, um, how the world was created. If Christ came to redeem us, if he didn't come to redeem our sins, if that was the purpose, and that's where we start seeing some changes, um, in the Greek Orthodox church, because I believe later on, they don't accept that um, he came down to redeem Adam's sin. Um, Arius, um, again, regained favor after the first creed was created in 325. Again, it says 60 years later, around 380, they, they had another change. So, um, some of the disagreements, <laughs> Athanasius um, was exiled at least five times. Um, the creed was described as homo, I'm not going to be able to say this word, homoousian, um, made of the same stuff and didn't explain how logos could be the same as the father without being the second God. Marcellus, the Bishop of Ansaria, uh, proposed a new term, homo usian, of like or similar nature. So in other words, it's, it's again, is um, Christ is made of this. It's basically is Christ the same as God? And that continues, whether it's he is the same person or is he similar to God? Eventually, the two definitions of logos saying like nature and similar nature agreed and opposed Arius, who said the son was distinctly different than God. Hey, Marilyn. Uh-huh. This is Jane. Um, I'm also reading it and it's page 109 just to kind of help people clarify between Athanasius and Arius, that Arius insisted that um, Jesus had been promoted by God to divine status. So that's kind of, that, that's that thing that you were saying earlier that, that, uh, that he, he had to be created by, the, by God. It wasn't God, it wasn't Jesus there from the beginning with God. I think that was the big debate at that time. Is that, is that right? That so, um, so Arius um, basically was saying he didn't know if he was created by God or at the same time as God. Okay. Well, I don't know. I'm, I'm just... Yeah, it's kind of confusing. I think Arius said that Jesus was a created person, created being. He wasn't pre-existent with God. So he's not the same as God for that reason, because he wasn't in the very beginning with God. He was created by God. Yeah, yeah, that sounds right. Well, and I think Arius had a, a real problem, and I, I understand his problem of saying Jesus is God because they've spent years becoming monotheistic, and now we have another God. I think that was a, a point of debate for a lot of people and trying to reconcile that. Yeah, for at least the first 300 years. <laughs> mm-hmm. And, and this is this is kind of a good summary on page 109. At the very top, it says Anathe- An- Athanasius 
is in the divine world. So he's more concentrating on whether Christ is divine and Arius is in the created order. So Arius is more thinking about how, you know, who was created first and how they were created. So that was really a lot of what they were arguing about, trying to figure things out. So, I mean, we, we could have hours of discussion today even on some of these things. So it's amazing that they even came to agreement in 323. So, um, so let's see. So let's see. The two de- eventually, the two definitions of logos um, saying like nature and similar nature agreed and opposed Arius, who said the sun was distinctly different than God. Um, now the church has opted for a paradox of incarnation, despite its incompatibility with monotheism. Christians were still confused. If there was one God, how could the Logos also be divine? So around this time, um, three Cappadocians um, that had had a solution and they were for the Eastern Orthodox Church, but they were all trained in Greek philosophy. So they could argue and understand both the Christianity and the Greek Orthodox way of thinking. And you see that Christi- you will see that Christianity starts moving to a Western view versus um, Greek Orthodoxy is stays in the Eastern view. So Basil is a, is a bishop and his brother Gregory is a bishop of Nicaea. And then Gregory has a friend, Gregory, and they are all very well versed. And um, so they start their opinions on things. Basil indicated that both Christian teachings were essential to religion. And I'm probably going to say these words wrong. Um, kerygma. Uh, public teachings of the church based on scriptures and dogma, deeper meaning of the Bible, truth, only understood through experience and expressed in symbolic form. Some religious insights had an inner resonance um, so that they could only be apprehended by each individual in their own time during what Plato called theory, theoria, theoria. Uh, contemplation. Basil, Basil said these elusive religious realities could only be suggested in symbolic gest- gestures of liturgy or better still by silence. We cannot see God intellectually, but if we let ourselves be enveloped <laughs> In the cloud, like Moses that descended upon Mount Sinai, we will feel his presence. And reading a lot of this, it was really interesting. It made me really think how I need to pray and meditate because they have these visions of of Christ. And um, the Holy Spirit, whose presence within us was said to be our salvation, must be divine, not a mere creature. The explanation of the Trinity and how they related to Greek philosophy made Basil and the two Gregories known. This word, I'm probably going to pronounce it French, Wisa, of an object was that which made it something it was, usually applied to the object as it was within itself. So the object itself, Oisa, hypostasis was used to denote the object from without or the appearance of the object. Cappadocians use the word prosopan um, as hypostasis. That's more like the looking at the outside of the object 
and guessing what it was on the inside, like facial expression, a state of mind, or a role someone is about to perform. They're using these terms because, because they're trying to describe God, Christ as he came to earth, and also the Holy Spirit as he appeared to the apostles. And so they're saying, you know, we're only seeing the outside and they're trying to logically explain how it could be one person, even though we visually see it as three separate persons. So these words are used for that purpose. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are terms we use as a way he has made himself known. The Trinity should not be seen as a literal fact, but as a paradigm that corresponds to real facts in the hidden life of God. Greek versus uh, Western view of the Trinity. The differences between Greek and Western use of the word theory is instructive. Eastern Christianity theora would always mean contemplation. In the West, theory has come to mean rational hypothesis, which must be logically demonstrated. There were only three uh, Latin theologians in Nicaea. Most were Western uh, Christians, were not up to uh, this level of discussion since they wouldn't understand the Greek terminology. So unless they studied Greek um, and Plato, uh, many felt unhappy with the doctrine of the Trinity. Augustine was the Latin theologian who defined the Trinity for the Latin church. He was a Platonist and devoted Platonist and, and disposed to the Greek doctrine. He said, our Greek friends have spoken of one essence and three substances, but Latin of one essence or substance and three persons. So again, Greek is one essence and three substances, Latin, one essence and three persons. Augustine's approach was not metaphysical like the Greeks, but psychological and highly personal. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Augustine is called the founder of the Western spirit. St. Paul was the only other theologian who is more influential in the West than St. Augustine. Augustine was hesitant to accept baptism, and it goes into a long detail about St. Augustine, because he, he felt Christianity entailed celibacy, and I wish I could, I could find that the description, but it's really, it, it's really funny, his prayer on celibacy, and, and how, you know, he wanted to, he wanted to practice it, but he had a hard time with it. Um, however, he had a, a painful rebirth experience and, and that's what it's called in the book. It's basically, he had some kind of hallucin a hallucination. It was very vivid when he was with his friend Alapius in, in Milan and he had this vision and I think it really changed his life and, and he, then became he was not baptized and he became baptized and became um, celibate after that point, after his experience. Greek theologians didn't bring their personal experiences into their writing. However, Augustine used his personal life when writing his confessions. And I've read a lot of Augustine's confessions and, you know, he was very highly religious and um, and he did use a lot of, I want to say, um, meditation in his prayer. 
He wrote the Treaties de Trinité early in the fifth century. So um, 400s, he was, he was writing a lot about the Trinity. Augustine says, we start by considering the mind loving itself. We find not a Trinity, but a dual love and mind. Augustine and the Western view of the Trinity. Anticipating uh, Descartes' remarks, Augustine argues that knowledge of ourselves is the bedrock of our certainty. Uh, Retineo, holding the truths of the incarnation in our minds. Contempleo, contemplating them. And dialecto, delighting in them. Um, these are three things that that Augustine uses quite a bit in his in his prayer and his his centering and meditation. Um, the fall of Rome influenced Augustine's doctrine on original sin and would later influence the Western world. Marilyn. Uh huh. I think I should point out community price does not accept the uh, doctrine of original sin. Okay. Which, makes it, which poses a new question for us on which they were arguing about back then about uh, the purpose of Jesus' death versus what is it, what much of Christianity believes that his death was for. Okay, so, and, I, and, and we need to look at the creed at the very end because I need to look at that again and see, I think it, it mentions the original sin in it, but that's where I know that the Greek Orthodox vary from the creed as well. So that's good to know. So um, yeah, that is very controversial. And, you know, a lot of people disagreed why Christ, you know, died for Adam's sin. And if that was really why he came down, um, to save us. So, so basically you're saying original sin. Okay. So let me make sure I understand this. So, so, um, so Christ, Christ came down, but it wasn't to save us from original sin or original sin. Explain that to me a little bit. Well, what original sin is, <laughs> No, I know what original sin. Okay, so I'll tell you what the Catholics. So the Catholics believe that 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 original sin is is on all of our souls when we're born. It's it's passed on through birth, and that baptism is a way of of um, getting rid of that original sin. So, and then I could go on into detail I'm about if you're not bad. Do you want uh, hot water or tea or anything? Okay. Somebody needs to be silenced. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, so then I could go on about if you're a, a baby and you're not baptized, you're in limbo for a while and, and until you're, Maybe. until mm -hmm. prayers resolve that. But anyway, um, that's what we think of original sin, but you're saying that you are not born with original sin. Is that what your belief right. is? We're not, <clears throat> we're not held accountable for whatever Adam did. Okay. We are held accountable for what we We're think. accountable for our own sins, but not for Adam's sin. Okay. So, so basically are, do you have to be baptized in your church? Well, you have to become a member of the church. You were baptized. Yeah. Most okay. Okay. So, you, but but it's not it's not getting rid of original sin. It's just basically becoming a member of your church. Well, mm -hmm. Marilyn, we we believe that around age eight is the age of accountability. So, you're not baptized okay. until you know the difference between sin and innocence. And so that's kind okay. of where that concept came into it for us. So we, we bless babies classes rather than confirmation classes when when the kids turn eight or older. OK, yeah, we have a confirmation later on, like I think it's 12 yeah, I think or something like same. that. But I think it's the same concept in the in the different religions. Your confirmation classes 
are our baptismal classes because we don't believe in original sin. We believe that a baby is born innocent and it isn't until somebody kind of learns something about life when they can make that choice of being. Yes. And see, because, because we have confession, we, we do, um, we do um, classes in like first grade, when they make their first communion, we start talking about sin and confession and all of that. So that's, that's kind of the evolution of, of how we think. So um, that's good to know. Okay. Can I jump in? Yes. Um, in, in my mind, we, we do believe in baptism as a bodily expression of the acceptance of Jesus Christ. And that um, with our membership, we're saying we'll accept or recognize other denominations baptism but if you've never been baptized we want we do require baptism and um but then the the confirmation which is the acceptance of the holy spirit that's what we use as membership and so the baptism is not key that that one of our elders baptized that we do want them baptized for as as for membership and and that is interesting because i i learned about um baptism um in a different way when i was going through an annulment for my marriage in the catholic church in case i wanted to get remarried in the catholic church and if i marry someone that is not catholic if they were baptized in a christian church which I'm guessing it has to be baptized in a way that that original sin was forgiven. I'm thinking they aren't very clear on that, but 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 that they don't have to be baptized again. But in thinking about this, I'm thinking that that has to be what they needed. That the, well, the person that I was thinking about marrying was was Presbyterian. So he probably, um, went being baptized as Presbyterian was, um, believed in original sin. So, and baptism, that's what I'm thinking. So this no, goes I, into more, more no, depth. I have a question for the yeah. Christ people. Cause, uh, I do find it interesting that we have never believed in original sin. And, um, Jerry actually quoted the, um, Bible, we we have what's called the inspired version that Joseph Uh Smith actually changed a lot of the Bible, including Genesis. And so last week, Mm -hmm. Jerry quoted the part where Adam was baptized. And somebody explained to me who knows the, the history of our church a little bit better, is that when our church began to say that there was no original sin because Adam was baptized? Because I, I kind of missed that part of our own history. Anybody? Uh, Jerry, you're muted. Yeah, but he can't really hear. Could you repeat that again, yeah. Um, Jane? Yeah, he, he um, said he quoted the, the inspired version last week. Right. Um, Adam was baptized in the beginning. Right. Or right. Adam was baptized. I'm wondering, is that when the um, Joseph Smith began to teach that there was no original sin? Is that when that began? Jane, I don't have, uh, I'm not sure that I'm hearing you all okay, but I don't have any uh, I'm not making any suggestion that uh, there is no original sin. I think the scripture do talk in terms of original sin, and that's the sin that Adam himself personified uh, himself. But what God did provide is that uh, our our lives are not uh, forever uh, condemned because of original sin. God forgives people and he calls us to be baptized 
not for original sin, but for our own sin, uh, for our own failures. And uh, and he is uh, ready to forgive, but it's not simply like a mechanical movement that we've got to go in the water and come out again. Our church history, I think, I do think of this, our church history includes, as I recall, in the time when Joseph Smith's uh, young son, I believe it was Joseph Smith, died in infancy or uh, and without ever having baptized. And he asked God for whether or not, uh, because of original sin, his young son was uh, condemned because he'd never been baptized. His understanding and his testimony was that no, that uh, men are not, or people are not condemned uh, uh, if they don't go through the process of baptism, uh, but they are, uh, they are commanded to go to be baptized for their own sins and uh, it's up to God then to determine uh, whether or not at what point there needs to be uh, baptism. And but for a small child who died, uh, who dies in infancy, or for a small child under any circumstances, or for adults for that matter, if they don't have the opportunity to baptize, to uh, be baptized, that does not mean that God has some kind of automatic. Uh, zap that's going to zap you forever. God is basically a God of forgiveness, and He calls us to be baptized to the extent that we have the opportunity to do that. Okay. I, and I'm I'm sorry, I didn't mean to rattle on like that, and I don't know if I've uh, helped on the question or not. I'm sorry. That explains. That's a you good know one one thing, Jane that. Um, you know, Joseph Smith in his writings, whether it was the inspired version or the Book of Mormon or anything else, um, he had his intent was to try to solve or to answer all of the great theological riddles that, um, you know, people talked about in his time in the early 19th century, in the, in the 1800s. And I think he was wrestling with the same question that the early church fathers, Augustine, and the different ones that we have talked about were wrestling with. And that is the question of, you know, was Jesus fully divine? Was he fully human or was he an amalgamation somehow of the two? And to take that a step farther, the other question we've been talking about this morning is, was Jesus present uh, with God, uh, you know, pre uh, pre-creation. In other words, is Jesus, Jesus eternal? Or like Dennis was describing um, uh, what the Arian heresy was, uh, was Jesus just a human being that started out, but he progressed uh, because of his righteousness uh, along some kind of a continuum that allowed him to be uh, similar to God by the time his life ended. Uh, very and and she compared the the author compares that to what the Buddhists believe you know going from one level to the next until you achieve nirvana and and enlightenment. So that's kind of like what Ar Arius was saying about Jesus. So I think this whole um, the story that that Joseph postulated about Adam being baptized and fulfilling the gospel served a couple of purposes for the early church. Uh, number one, it validated that baptism was for everybody, even all the way back to Adam. But it also places Jesus in the, you know, for this to happen, uh, Jesus had to have already existed. So there was a pre-existent Jesus prior to the creation of the world. So Joseph is solving that problem too. He's saying, well, obviously Jesus must have pre-existed human creation. Therefore, Jesus is Fully, fully divine, and Jesus is fully eternal along with God. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, could I add something to what Paul was just saying? Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I'd just like to point uh, to the book of Genesis in uh, the inspired version of the Bible. That's the version, of course, that, uh, Joseph Smith. that uh, came through Joseph Smith. 
But I'd like to point to the first chapter of Genesis in the inspired version and to uh, verses 27 through about 29 or 30. And let me just read that because I think it is relevant to what we're talking about this morning. It says, And I, God, said unto mine only begotten, which was with me from the beginning, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and it was so. And I, God, said, Let them have dominion over the fishes of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And verse 29, And I, God, created man in mine own image, in the image of mine only begotten, created I him, male and female, I created, created I them. And uh, I, God, blessed them and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air uh, and uh, over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And uh, it seems to me that's suggesting that uh, Jesus was with God in the beginning in the sense of the creation of the earth itself. And uh, what we're talking about this morning challenges my understanding because it's difficult to understand some of these things about God and Jesus being separate and yet one. Uh, but anyway, that helps me, and I uh, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry and Paul. Sorry about the, di the diversion there, <laughs> Marilyn. No, I I'm glad that we're having this discussion because I didn't, you know, I, I after reading some of this, I didn't realize that, that Greek Orthodox kind of um didn't i i'm pretty sure they don't believe in the original sin um on your soul after you're born and um so this helps me to understand that it's it's more than that so um and, and i truthfully have a hard time believing that a baby that's not that's not baptized you know is you know well i guess in limbo so um for a while. So no. it, this is a good discussion. Well, I have one more thing back to was Jesus, why Jesus came. I've always been taught. And so I firmly believe it because I've always been taught this, that, that Jesus came to lift that original sin. That's why he could not have his legs broken on the cross because he had to be the flawless lamb with no blemish. That's why he never, he's been proclaimed to have never sinned because he has to be the flawless um, sacrifice with no sin, no broken bones, the flawless sacrifice to God for the original sin. So I'm real surprised to hear even a debate on was he the the sacrifice for the original sin. And um, he came, the only way through to God is through Jesus because he is the one that you have to accept his sacrifice for the original sin. And so I'm just real surprised to even um, have that questioned. We're just um, trying to find the origins of the belief though, Robin. We're not we're not questioning it, but you know, it, it's not like we just all woke yeah. up and learned it. We had, it had to come from, in our religion, it came from Joseph Smith originally, but then we go back to Augustine to figure it out too. I mean, I think the, the, the way I see the purpose in this class is to actually explore how we got to our beliefs. I like finding out why, not just this is what I was taught, but this, you know, where was it from in the beginning? You mm -hmm. know, I mean, everybody gets to choose their belief systems, but I do think it's important that we talk about where the belief system came from. 
Well, I, I did a sermon uh, one time that was discussing the fact that, this is Arlene, uh, that was discussing the fact that Christ came to take the place of the, of the uh, blood and burnt offerings that uh, the Jews were uh, required to make prior to his coming. And that his blood spilt uh, took the the place of you know, and it it served as accepting all of our sins um, up to that time, and that that was why we no longer had to do uh, you know live. Um, blood offerings and burnt offerings uh, at temples. Well, I think we have to take a look at this book and realize that Christianity is an evolving concept. I'm a little heretic. I guess you all can send me into exile. I've been very interested to read through the various lines of thinking and, and postulating what was the meaning of Jesus' life. Because it wasn't just one path. That's why there's an Eastern church, a Western church. That's why there are Muslims, you know, everything else. I never believed in original sin. Even as a small child, I think I realized I don't believe that. That's me not speaking for anybody else. I am responsible for my sins. And I have plenty of my own. I don't have Adam's sin on me or Nero's sin or anybody else's sin. I have plenty of my own to answer for and to make, take corrective action. And I don't think Jesus came because Adam sinned. I just, I don't believe that. So, I am probably not a mainline Christian, but there are a lot of people throughout time that have tried to figure out what was Jesus' mission and purpose. Okay, end of rant. And that's where the Eastern Orthodox or Greek Orthodox has a different viewpoint, really, is their, their concept of Jesus um, was leads to deification, a process, is the way I understand what they believe, so that he came to be like an example, the first true human being who uh, achieved deification. And as an example for all who follow him versus the Western viewpoint, which is that he was... Um, divine to start with, and he died to satisfy this original sin, um, which is, I, I don't know if that's prevalent entirely in the Western view or not, but at least in some of Western Christianity, that's the view of his purpose. So there's- Well, well, well the other on, thing, oh, go ahead. I was gonna say, to tag on to what Robin said and what Sharon said, um, I, I think Sharon's exactly right. I think, you know, th this is 2,000 years of um, evolved theology that we're looking back at, none of which existed at the time of Christ. Th these are all things that the church developed in their beliefs about Jesus in the time since his, since his death. Um, and I think it's, you know, the Apostle Paul never talked about original sin. I think something this important uh, had there been that concept in 50 or 60 AD, he would have said something about it. What Paul said was, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Um, so I think original sin clearly is something that came much later, you know, in, in the church. And then if we, you know, if you go on in this chapter, she kind of talks about what the original sin was. It was the, um, it was the act that, that creates a human being. And so it was Augustine or some other celibate guy like him that, that probably thought sex was evil uh, that developed that whole concept. 
and said that's you know that's the sin that's what adam was guilty of because he was he was fallen and you know had to procreate and and the women got the blame for it she she alludes to that yeah. in the chapter as well uh, you know, the, the women, because they're sexy, I guess, uh, and attract the men are at fault. And so they're kind of like the carriers of original sin. Well, we can look at that in 2021 and say, you know, I'm not sure that that really squares with what I know about how the universe works very well. When we talk about, uh, you know, the, the hormone Pitocin that causes uh, one person in their brain cells to be attracted to another person, you know, male or female. Um, you, you know, you can't just identify that stuff as sinful and not take into account where we are today and what we understand today about how the human body works and how the interactions of uh, emotions between two people are not just looking at somebody. It, it has to do with, with our physiology and what's going on there. So I'm just going to say that, that for my part and say that, you know, all of the things that we have been taught, all of the things that have been handed down to us have value. But let's keep the perspective that um, that was developed by human beings. Uh, th there are people who did that writing and, and made those decisions and gave that to us. Um, the, you know, there was no great revelation that came to anybody about human sin. 300 and some guys got together and raised their hand and said, yeah, that looks good. I'll vote for that. And, and so here we are today. I'm done. <clears throat> well, well, you added basically one of the things that I was going to say, and we'll talk about a little bit later, and that is if you start talking about original sin, and then that changes the way that certain religions look at things, but also talks about the way that, that it affects the way they look at women and their roles in the church, um, and why a lot of women have not been ordained in, you know, the Western churches as much as like the Greek Orthodox and some of the other religions or why, I don't know if this is the reason, but why um, the priests are not allowed to marry. So anyway, um, yeah, I mean, all of this is fascinating to me and, and looking back and seeing how we evolved over time and where we were influenced by different thoughts. So, yeah. Okay, we'll just move on after we're... Um, original sin. So um, it says that God had condemned uh, humanity to death because of Adam's disobedience. The inherent sin was passed on to the descendants through the sexual act. And some of this, it sounds like I, I know not everybody agrees with. So, okay, here's the word. Concu Concupiscence. Concupiscence. Con Thank you. Concupiscence. Concupiscence is the desire to take pleasure in mere creatures instead of God, most acutely felt during the sexual act. Neither Jews, Greek Orthodox, or Muslims would adopt the doctrine of original sin. So, um, the West has developed a uh, mis misogynistic tendency influenced by the letters of Jerome and loathing female and Tertullian who called women evil temp temptresses. Western Christianity never recovered from this belief of women and original sin and is seen in an unbalanced reaction to the ordination of women. And, you know, maybe. Um, I mean, you guys ordinate women into the church. So um, not that, that that was something that you even considered, but I'm just, I'm, you know, trying to understand. I mean, this makes more sense to me why some women aren't ordinated now that um, I see this perspective, but. We had, Marilyn, we weren't ordained until 1984. So it's, it's still a fairly new concept in our church, too. I think Mission Road's pretty good at accepting it, but it split our church almost in half. Oh, really? Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> it was huge. So is that when you split from um, the, uh, the, the, the church and you went on your own? No, that was when Joseph Smith was killed. Joseph Smith was killed in eight. 
what tell me tell me the year 1844 i think okay 1844. oh okay okay and then our church didn't form until 1860 with his son so that's a whole nother lesson marilyn <laughs> but, but okay. the, the mormons do not ordain women yet i, I don't believe i don't believe okay it. so okay. so it is, a, it is a difference that we have from them yeah have they ordained blacks yet I think yes. 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 I think they originally, yeah, Nadine said maybe the 70s, they started ordaining uh, black men to the Aaronic priesthood, and now I think they can hold the Melchizedek priesthood as well, but I'm not sure when that took place. That was real white of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Only, only Dorothy could get away oh with that. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Uh, okay. All right. Moving on. In in um, 529, Emperor Justinian uh, closed the last school for the Greek philosophy and pagan philosophy went underground. Four years later, four mystical treaties appeared and thought to be Denny's, the Areopagit, I'm probably saying that wrong, St. Paul's first Athenian uh, convert. Um, so pseudo Denny's people that believe like Denny's was able to wed to God of the Greeks to the Semitic God of the Bible and define two theological traditions of the apostles. Um, charismatic gospel was clear and knowledgeable. Dogmatic gospel was silent and mystical. The meaning was for all Christians. The mystical part could be conveyed through language and gestures of the liturgy. The reasons that parts were hidden behind the mystical veil was to lift Christians above the perception and to experience the inexpressible reality of God himself. Denny didn't like to use the word God, but use theurgy, a pagan term meaning tapping of the divine manna by means of sacrifice and divination. Okay. Even the word God is, is, is faulty since God was above God, a mystery beyond being. He is above all names, just as he is above all being. We have to leave behind all of our conceptions of the divine, we, we call to a halt to activities of our minds. We even have to leave our denials of God's attributes behind. Then and only then shall we achieve the ecstatic union with God. Then he uses the example of Moses on Mount Sinai, where he saw nothing but a thick, dark cloud. It is a paradigm beyond all thoughts. Again, they're trying to explain how, how the Trinity could be look different, but be the same. As in Judaism, Denny's God has two aspects. One is turned toward us and manifests himself in, in the world. The other is far side of God as he is in himself, which remains entirely, entirely incomprehensible. He stays within himself is his eternal mystery at the same time as he totally is immersed in creation. Eventually, Greeks ad agreed with Denny's two aspects of God. Okay. Greeks and Latins developed a different view of divinity of, of Christ. Greek concept developed by Maxim, Maximus, uh, the confessor in 580, uh, well, a little bit around five, 600, known as the father of Byzantine theory, Maximus believed that humans, human beings would only fulfill themselves when they had been united to God, just as Buddhists believed that enlightenment was, enlightenment was humanity's proper destiny. Men and women had potential for divine and would become fully human only 
if it was realized. So I have a question, Marilyn. Uh -huh. So what you call the, um, the Greek approach at one with God versus the Western approach is atonement. A little, it's the same word, but it's pronounced, I mean, you, you read it a little differently. So Greeks believe in at one with God, unity with God. And then Western thought seems to be atonement where, uh, Jesus is trying to atone for things. That's a good question. Um, I, you know, I don't know the answer to that. Um, oh, they've been fighting that for thousands of years, so you don't have to. <laughs> Well, it is, this is really hard to understand. I mean, it's, it's hard to wrap your head around all these different theories and, and really follow along because it's a, it's a really tough book. Let's just put it that way, <laughs> but it's good. It's good. Um, it's really, it really makes us think and really makes us discuss, which I think is really important. Um, and maybe, maybe when we get towards I want to read more about about the the, um, the Greek theology a little bit because I still I don't understand it and it, this brings a question to my mind as well. Yeah, Marilyn, I thought the same thing when I read this. It's like I didn't realize there was such a distinction between the the Greek Orthodox, you know, and the Eastern religion versus ours. I mean, I I like how Dennis said that. I, I'm not sure if that was Dennis making up those words or if it was yes. the book, but I like that because the, the Eastern version of Christianity in this chapter was more internal looking at the Trinity inside yes. a person versus the Western version, which is what became the American version is the external, you know, Jesus was, you, you know, a, we, he atoned for the sin for us. So that's why we have the atonement. It's like this external version of the Trinity. I, I like that distinction. Well, and you think about it and you think about Eastern and you think about Buddhist and enlightenment. And I think it's more, that makes more sense, you yeah. know, that that's the direction that they went versus um, ours is more external. Yeah. It's interesting. So, okay. So um, I, I, I'm, let me just, let's see here. I want to see where I'm at. Oh, I'm almost done. I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so um, Anselin, the Bishop of Canterbury, wrote a treatise, Why God Became Man. Now we're, we're into the 1000, the year 1000. Um, the sin of Adam required atonement and must be repaid by one who was both God and man. In the Trinity, the Father transmits all that he is to the son, giving up everything, even expressing himself as another word. Once the word is spoken, the father remains silent. The only word we know is the logos or the son. But the symbol of the Trinity must be transcended because it's not even to envision God as man and acting the same as ourselves. The, the doctrine of incarnation can be used to neutralize the danger of idolatry. Um, Jesus was the first and last word to the human race, making future revelation unnecessary. Okay. Marilyn, this is Laura. I don't uh -huh. understand that last sentence. Okay, uh, let's go back. Maybe somebody can help me understand that. Jesus was the first and last word to the human race, making future revelation unnecessary. Don't we have future revelation? I guess I'm confused. Or is yeah, that well, talking about uh, the, not, what not, not all churches do, Laura? I was going to say, I know, you, that's true. Cer certainly the Latter-day Saint movement embraces that, but there's a lot of Christian religions that would agree with that final statement there that Marilyn okay. shared, okay. Um, that, that Jesus was the revelation. 
Okay. Thank you. You know, it's, you know for years we interpreted that um, scripture when Jesus was talking to Peter and Jesus says, upon this rock, I will build my church. And, and most Christian denominations would say that Peter would be the first apostle, that that was the meaning of, of what Jesus said. Uh, Latter-day Saintism said, no, Jesus was talking about uh, revelation because he just asked Peter, who, do, you know, who, who am I? Who do people say that I am? And, you know, Peter says, well, you're the son of God. And Jesus says, well, flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but, you know, the spirit of God. So, so we interpret that to mean revelation was, was the key uh, to, to Christianity. But we're, we're in the minority. Most, most Christian religions would not see it that way. So let me let me just read the follow up sentence to to that that's in the book, because that's exactly how it was in the book. Consequently, like Jews, they were scandalized when a prophet arose in Arabia during the seventh century who claimed to have received a direct revelation from their God to have brought a new scripture to his his people. Um, of course, that's Islam. So um, I think. Yeah. So this basically, I think. Um, that just talks a little bit more about about that. So I probably shouldn't have ended with that sentence, but anyway, <laughs> I liked it. Thanks for thanks for asking because I I had to look at it again too. This is really tough material. Okay, so here's 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 the um the a comparison of the creeds. This was on the internet and it was called the Book of Common Prayer in 1979. And I was trying to find one that was common. And this is kind of similar to what the Catholic Church used. Um, we did change a few words and I bolded those words because- Wait, we're, We don't see it yet. You don't see what? We don't the see bold? the creeds yet. You don't see the creeds yet? Yeah, push I your, do. Push your I do. I see it. I can see it. I see it. I think some of us are slower than others. It'll come up. Never mind. <laughs> no, we're not see it? slow, Jane. There it goes. My computer is slow today. Oh, wow. Okay. 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 Not you, your computer. Okay. So I'm just going to kind of go through this. Um, basically, I'm going to just say we believe in God. We've said that forever, um, but we changed it to I believe. So we were making our own um, our own confirmation, not just um, the general church when we said this in mass, but we say this for everything. So it's always said in mass once, but it's said in baptism and other times. Um, and then um, in one God, the Father Almighty, which is very similar, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. Well, we change the words from seen and unseen to things visible and invisible. I think that was questionable before. And again, we changed we believe to I believe the only son of God. We changed it to the only begotten son of God. Um, again, we did this in 2011. Um, eternally begotten of the father, born of the father before all ages. And, and most of the creeds you'll find online are very similar to this. There's the, um, okay, so um, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, one in being with the father, and we change the word to consubstantial with the father, meaning the same with the father, the same as the father. Um, through him, all things were made. So Marilyn, the, the, uh -huh. the Catholics believe that it's that whole debate that you were talking about earlier, same versus similar, the Catholics actually say same. We just changed it. Yes, that word was changed in 2011. That's why the bread, that's why your communion is the actual. No, that's another thing. Never mind. I'm confused. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that's okay. Um, Marilyn, I have a question about the word begotten. It said that Jesus was begotten, not made. Um, is there a different understanding about that? Because the only definition that I can find for begotten means, um, you know, to be um, created as a child, you know, to, to be born. But, but, um, but if, if the Catholic Church is saying that Jesus was with God from the beginning, and yet he's begotten, is that referring to his, his earthly birth? 
I have to, I'm going to, um, when I get done with this, I, there's an explanation and I can read it because I can't, okay. <laughs> I can't remember why they did what they did, but, but I'll read it. <laughs> that, that just seemed like a little dichotomy to me that it was. I know, I know. Um, and, and we'll, and, and if I don't tell you the answer, I'll, I'll, uh, I can tell you next week, but I'll see if we have time. We'll see what time is it. Do we have to be done at, at 10, 15? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. So let's see in accordance. Okay. So now we're on to, let's see, for us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven and by the power of the Holy Spirit um, was incarnate um, of the Virgin Mary. And I wasn't sure if, but it looks like that's used quite a bit. So, and became man. Um. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. He suffered death and was buried. And he rose again on the third day um, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come in glory to judge the living and the dead. Um, let's see. And his kingdom will have no end. Um, we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds through the Father and the Son, with the Father and Son is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. I believe in the Holy Catholic um, and Apostolic Church. Um, I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. Um, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing, but then I'm going to go back to my Word document and see if I can find that while you guys talk. See if I can give you an answer to that. Um, any, you guys can talk while I'm looking for it. I, I do find it interesting how similar the Nicene Creed is in the Catholic Church now that it was in... 326 or whatever that day was i mean it, it's yeah enough you know that 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 has really stayed true in, it has stayed true yeah. i mean I, I i there isn't anything i've pretty much said the same thing almost my whole life so except we we change it a little bit like for baptism and um i think we shorten it um it looks like to me the uh this modern version compared to what's on page 111 after on 111 it says and we believe in the holy spirit and that's the end of the of the creed and then that one goes on quite a few more verses and they've they mentioned in here in the book that some people thought that the holy spirit got the short end of the stick on what the what the holy spirit was about there's only one sentence there Okay, so consubstantial was used because it means he equally shares the Father's divinity as the person of the Holy Trinity. I'm just reading some of the notes that were in part of this write-up of what the changes were for. Let's see. Um, uh, homo, homo seus, same substance, was affirmed over like substance. Um, okay, let's see. That, that's that's amazing to me. 2011, the Catholic Church is still debating the exact same thing they were debating in the in the year 300s, whether it's you know same or simple similar substance. So, oh, Paul, you were asking about begotten Son. Is that what you were asking about? Yeah, I just wondered if there was another meaning that. Okay, let me read dictionary. what it says here. In addition, the New Creed translate recovers Christ's title, only begotten son, um, fili ungenit, I think that's probably Latin, um, son something, which we also saw in the revised Gloria to say the son is born of the father before all ages is a very profound theological truth for the son is not born in the human sense of beginning one's life, but essentially proceeds from the Father while being always fully God. 
Okay, thanks. I wouldn't. I just wasn't sure if that referred to the earthly birth or something else. It sounds like it's something else. Yeah. So anyway, um, any other questions? Good discussion. Good job, I would Marilyn. Just share that that I've attended several Lutheran services, and every service I've ever been to, they open up their hymnal and read the creed. Yeah, I think a lot of churches do that, um, but I don't know for sure, but I know I've heard it in other churches and it's very similar. One of the things that bothers me about the creed is all the emphasis is on his birth and his death and resurrection and the life is relegated to a comma between <laughs> birth and death. So there's no there's no discuss, no emphasis on his life on earth. That that troubles me, bothers me a lot. Well, and I think I think the whole purpose, if I'm I mean, I think is really that we believe in one God, you know, um, meaning the Trinity is one God. Um, and that he came he came down to save us. <laughs> 